shall we start with you yes uh, a very good afternoon and welcome to all the participants for this webinar here uh, my name is vidya bhushan i am deputy director at uh, lal bahadur shastri national academy of administration masuri today uh, we are here for a uh, webinar on affordable rental housing i uh, before kind of welcoming my panelists i would say that uh, this is a webinar which is part of a series of conversation that we are, we are having the first one was on the urban labor rights and the state's response in times of covid we had a very engaging discussion where we lot of people participated a lot of questions were asked and then we continued on the continued on to a very relevant issue for urban labors which is their housing how do we look at their uh, housing which is within their uh, let's say financial requirements so we looked at affordable rental housing in a uh, one and a half day long workshop where with the ministry and all other stakeholders in housing participated we had a very engaging discussion and i must also say that it's only around 7 minutes ago that we could close that workshop uh, there was a lot of questions a lot of uh, you know let's say comments and presentation by different uh, smaller groups which discussed the various aspects of affordable rental housing and now we are here Uh, presenting to you this webinar whereby uh, panelists will speak on different topics the way it will go is that around we will speak for around 35 40 minutes among all the panelists and then we'll be open for questions this uh, webinar has been uh, possible with the support of uh, indian institute of habitat development uh, with all the local self governance and mda and i'm thankful to all my panelists so uh, introduction of panel and moderation i would uh, kindly pass on to our dear friend gautam and swastik here with that i will close and uh, gautam can take over and uh, uh, again a very warm welcome to all my panelists thank you for joining thank you babe swastik so, would you like to introduce the theme of the webinar as well as the participants and i'll just briefly talk about the modalities and the use of the q and a box uh, in Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us. We have nearly 150 attendees so far, uh, and uh, I know from the registration they're from a very diverse, uh, 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 from, from very diverse backgrounds and organizations. Now, uh, the the question of rental housing has been brought to the fore again uh, recently by the announcement by the government of India of the affordable rental housing schemes. I mean, these are uh, I think a, a very big step and something that uh, can uh, really ignite the uh, the idea and the market around rental housing. I think they have the potential to do that. Uh, so so, but we're still uh, at this moment uh, uh, are debating what are the sort of you know all the dynamics that go into uh, instituting rental housing so to make rental housing like we have in advanced economies uh, one of the mainstays of the not only the housing sector or not, not only the housing market but also very strong part of the economy in that sense so that's where we are at and and we basically have, are doing this webinar to understand three aspects of rental housing that we need to consider uh, when thinking of you know what the future of rental housing or you know, what the future of the housing market will be uh, so the first is that we have to understand what demand is what kind of people uh, who are the people who are actually demanding what are the characteristics how, what is the nature of this demand uh, the second question is the question of supply because it is finally also a strongly economic question that there has to be a demand and supply which has to match and so what is the kind of supply uh, for example the arc scheme or there are uh, previous schemes by various state governments that have tried to supply rental housing but the large supply is happening still in the informal market as we all know so we want to understand what are the nature of supply how it's actually catering to the demand that is there um and in terms of public provision in terms of state provision or even in partnership provision of rental housing i think one of the important aspects is that we have to sustain occupancy over a long period of time it is not a, a, a you know like a build and forget model in which i allocate houses and i can walk away from it it is not possible to do that i have to maintain a rent occupy a certain occupancy i have to maintain rent payments i have to basically look at a long term cash flow as well as a social and economic uh, change that may actually take place over 5 10 15 25 25 years i'm involved basically as a supplier we'd be involved in a project for a much longer period of time so the question of management of rental housing therefore becomes much more critical so so the panelists here are going to speak to these questions they're not separate in that sense of course so they'll be speaking to these questions and uh, there will definitely be certain overlaps uh, we have with us uh, today uh, shri amrit abhijat sir who is basically uh, uh, the joint secretary of housing for all at the uh, uh, ministry of housing and urban affairs thank you very much sir for joining us uh, yesterday 
today for the workshop as well as today. Uh, we're very honored by your presence. You'll be talking about uh, some of the future that you see about uh, this rental housing question. Uh, we have uh, Mukta, who is basically from the Center for Policy Research. She's a research fellow there and has done a lot of work on informal rental, uh, what kind of markets exist and things like that. Darshini, of course, uh, a lot of us would know her uh, from Ahmedabad University and uh, who has understood informal land markets uh, uh, in various cities in the country and, and brought some very interesting detailed ideas about the question of land markets in, in uh, 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 informal uh, settlements, informal settings, basically. Uh, uh, Pankaj Kapoor from Leasis for us, uh, which is actually a real estate firm, uh, real, uh, sorry, a real estate uh, rating and research agency, which means uh, they are not actually agents or brokers. They're actually the people who do the groundwork to understand or to build intelligence on, on, on what kind of real estate uh, uh, products work in what kind of locations and things like that. So, and besides that, a lot more. I mean, I, Pankaj would best to introduce himself, uh, but uh, somebody who is basically understanding of uh, the finance side of what investors look for in rental housing, as well as what kind of markets actually exist in the housing submarkets in, in, in our country would be uh, useful to this discussion. Of course, uh, from the academy, we have uh, Vidya, who's uh, uh, one of the, uh, who's the director of the uh, Labasna and the National Center for Urban Affairs in, in Labasna, and uh, Gautam and I from uh, the Indian Institute for Human Settlements will be moderating. So I'll, that's a broad introduction of what we're trying to achieve. I'll leave it to Gautam to uh, just uh, sort of uh, set some expectations and, and uh, push us on our way ahead so one of the things we've learned well is webinars with large number of attendees work when they are tightly regulated um, much like a good affordable housing sector but not over regulated exactly like a good affordable housing sector so i'll be i'll be doing the soft touch hard touch of the regulation that's my role today uh, we've asked each of the panelists to take about 10 minutes and for panelists i will give you a two minute warning in the chat. Um, so just keep an eye on that for yourself. And then if it comes to a point where I have to unmute myself, we will be in the over-regulation sphere of, uh, of the webinar, if not the market. Um, for participants, uh, one of the things is that we would really like your questions to uh, be addressed in this, but because we've kept the webinar length short, please put them in the Q&A box, not in the chat. I want to just repeat this. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. You'll see a button in the webinar format for Zoom, which is on the same toolbar as your mute and your video on off buttons. The advantage of the Q&A a box is that actually questions can be directly answered by panelists by writing into the chat even if we don't have time to ask them out loud we'll certainly try and do for all the panelists i request you to take the time to look at the questions in the q a box you can answer them directly and we'll be filtering them that runs through and i'll give all panelists time at the end particularly all unanswered questions in the Q&A box will also combine into an email and send them to the panelists, hoping to get some answers at a later date, or at least a, a, a response from the moderating team uh, will come out and will come out publicly. Uh, as you know, this is being recorded and streamed live on YouTube, so please be aware of that. Uh, for panelists, just a reminder that when you're not speaking, please be aware of the mute button. Um, I believe the Oxford entry for new words this year has the phrase you're on mute as one of the most commonly uttered pandemic phrases. So I'm sure we'll, we'll utter it at least twice to play our part in the global moment, but let's try and control that as much as possible. Um, and uh, with, with that, well, I think we'll begin. Swastik, uh, would you like to uh, signal the order of the speakers, please? And we'll go from one to the other. Certainly, I think uh, we definitely request uh, Amrit sir to go first, uh, since uh, the, the the whole sort of context seems to have been built up because of the announcement of the affordable rental housing uh, scheme, complex scheme. Uh, Amrit sir, would, may I please request you, we have sent some questions to you beforehand that have come from uh, uh, audience that has registered. It would be really great if you could respond to those. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I'm really, really glad and very excited to be, to be a part of the second day of deliberations for the affordable rental housing complex. And uh, uh, very frankly speaking, I did not expect such amazing response and curiosity, which has been expressed by uh, the people from all around the country, in particular from academia and uh, also from uh, the other stakeholders. So I'll, what I'll try and do is that, of course, I'll be answering the questions and that will be for the most uh, part of the discussion. But I'll just run through briefly on what I spoke about yesterday, what is the scheme, what is the philosophy, and how we uh, you know, see uh, it developing as a story uh, as we go along. So uh, 
uh, we know that this COVID was a uh, you know, very important push factor for this policy to come about. Nonetheless, the important part is, was the realization that rental housing issue needed to be sorted out much, much uh, uh, earlier on. And uh, it was something uh, which we were, you know, it was an idea whose time has come basically. And uh, not everybody needs uh, ownership based house. People do not have very large incomes disposable enough to always invest in the housing project. And also that a large amount of houses was stuck uh, in the rental market because people fear uh, the whole uh, transaction when it comes to uh, rental housing on account of there being a very robust uh, tenancy law in the favor of uh, both the parties. So that is something that the ministry is addressing in, at a much comprehensive level. But uh, uh, under the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, which of course is meant for the EWS, LIG and the MIG, we thought that the migrant labor question has to be addressed because uh, the spirit of the Prime Minister's Awas Yojana pretty much gels along with the, the, the kind of clientele that we are trying to address in the ARNC. Of course, uh, there has to be a much more robust and an all-encompassing uh, uh, you know, arrangement under the Rental Control Act or the Model Tenancy Act, as we could call it, and the ministry is... Uh, working on it. So this is something that what we did and we wanted not only the government sector but the private entity to also come, which is why two models were there. One in which the uh, existing housing stock was to be taken up and the second was the uh, the private entity or the public entity coming on their either own piece of land or through some kind of an agreement between the parties. It could also be an agreement between the government land and private ownership parties. It's actually entirely upon the state government how they curate uh, the whole project to be. There are no hard and fast uh, rules in uh, this scheme. The only one or two compliances is that the beneficiary has to be from within the PMOI section. Rest, uh, we've left it to the enterprise of the Indian uh, uh, entrepreneur who would be taking this up along with the state government. The maximum room size also is a variant one. The mix is allowed where a single room, dormitory and all that would be done. We've taken care of economics and the institutional rental mechanism has been put in deliberately because we are quite aware that there may be people, those who resist uh, uh, paying rent on time, those who may not, uh, who may just disappear on one fine evening. So you need an institutional mechanism either through the industry to which the rental authorities are in touch with, where people have taken rent or through an aggregator, maybe I wouldn't be taking names, but pretty much like OYO and such kind of aggregators. And there may be yet another business opportunity lurking there where there are n number of aggregators for ARHC who do a very neat job like, uh, uh, you know, in the, the, the middleman market, if one would choose to call it, would become more regulated of people, those who want to also deal with the uh, letting out uh, uh, facilities in an ARHC. Uh, so this is about all that were the key features. Of course, this scheme was rolled out on the 31st. And as I speak, uh, the good news is that uh, once we look at the roadmap ahead, on the eve of the Gandhi Jayanti, we would be in a position to roll out the EOI for uh, the projects. And the state government, certain state government have already floated their RFPs for Model uh, 1. And uh, the ARHC knowledge pack was released by the Honorable Minister in which the EOI guidelines, FAQs are all there. And our website, which is presently the pmoi.gov.in on which this whole facility is there would be substituted by the ARHC website very soon uh, now because it's taking a lot of time to prepare uh, because we quite anticipate that this will be the play area on which the builder, the banker, the state governments, the ministry and the people of this country because once the accreditations are done we feel, I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little later, we will also have an accreditation system in which the people will get to know that this is a class one ARHC or a A category ARHC or a B category, depending on facilities. I quite foresee the possibility of certain people being able to see their ARHC on the camera screens, see actually their room. If it is room number 36 in Surat in some locality, he is able to see and satisfy the family that once he goes to Surat in an ARHC, the family is secure enough. And why this will work is because of the simple reason that economics will make it possible to uh, for ARHC owners, so to say, to market their product. 
like I've been asked questions on the economics of it. See, it's just like a hotel industry. If you have five ARHCs in a city, and there are two ARHCs where drunkards roam about, where the cleanliness is not proper, where there is uh, some kind of a extraction of rent-seeking people, the people will go to the B1 and go to C1. So the best will survive because of the shared economics and the openness and transparency that we will try to bring about, sitting about the system on the web portal itself. So that's about it. Uh, the model one and model two, as I've told you, the Rajkot has done a series of consultations that are happening uh, through you and many such organizations like Meretco and Kredai. We are reaching out to builders, to bankers, and there seems to be quite a good takeoff. But yes, uh, it is too early right now to say what the extent would be and how the people would adopt. But given the present situation and the interest, we feel that uh, this will take on. Uh, IEC will have a huge role to play because we may be very informed as an elite or a knowledge society, but it is the workers, the students, the rickshaw wallers, the auto wallers, the salesperson to whom we have to reach out to. So that perhaps will be a challenge in which uh, I would like to take the help of the civil society organizations because uh, uh, the two... Uh, the two important segments, one is the provider and the one who's needing it, must have a platform on which they are able to interact and it cannot always be web-based. So we quite realize the very critical role the civil society organizations, the urban local bodies, and uh, uh, also the middle-level managers will have to play in uh, taking this ahead as we go along. So uh, having stated this now, I'll try to come to the main key questions that have uh, come and have been given is one of the first important questions is how to move beyond government and private sectors so and how to involve the, uh, the civil society. A couple of ideas that come to my mind because frankly speaking uh, on the ARHC issues the ministry would not like to say that we know it all because it's just begun and uh, we are very open to taking suggestions. PMAY is one of those schemes in which we have brought many many changes as I've seen this scheme uh, you know, evolving over the five years. And that is the sign of a dynamic, robust, transparent government system where we are able to take on the advantages and take the criticisms also to be able to evolve the scheme, uh, which is why the GSTC came about, rule of technology, MIG and all that, which was introduced later and also enhancements in BLC houses. So civil society, one role that I can immediately think of is that when the urban local bodies go in for a local survey, the civil service, uh, the civil society can be involved. In the mobilization of people, those who want to, come to enter, enter into the ARHC, the civil society shall be involved. The social audit of the ARHCs where the facilities are there, the civil society can be involved. The civil society can be involved by the aggregators in making this uh, a very robust and transparent mechanism which the uh, ARHCs are deploying to be known to the people through the uh, civil society again. Urban local bodies, we will, will certainly have to probably conceive of a committee at the local level where there is an interaction between the ARHC owner, the aggregator, the urban local body and the people those who belong to that area because we don't want them to become typical ghettos where drunkards and illicit activities happen. So there has to be a breathing out and breathing in space between the ARSC owners, between the civil society. And that is where I think uh, that uh, the important role is. The uh, economics on which the uh, state government uh, will work, what is the economics of housing support? The IC, uh, the annual sub, uh, increments that we've allowed biennially for 4%. For, for and as I told you, the best will survive. So people after the accreditation will have to put up a front where they become desirable. And accreditation is going to help. Also, the TIG that we've given uh, ensures a lot of uh, assistance to the state government. Also, the state governments will be putting in a lot of money and uh, incentive in terms of either FAR space or infrastructure that they will provide in terms of roads, sewer, and all that. So there is a built-in of economics that we've tried to work out, but we are open to more ideas coming in what we could do. Uh, the key challenges that I think uh, is one of the important question is, I think land will continue to be challenged because the presumption is that the private sector will come about with their land. I think uh, its stratification and gentrification may become an issue. I can quite foresee that if the mechanism is not very robust, you have a city of Bangalore where you are getting an ARHC for just 1200 rupees and you are getting an ARHC for 7000. And the 7,000 is the ARHC where 
corporate sector people and the hoi polloi's and the you know business community are able to live in a very cushy thing by the name of arc and you have a 1200 uh, arc where you know people are just able to make ends so we have to balance these factors and that is where again the role of civil society rti and all those things will come into play also i think project finance banks do not uh, often understand the you know the perception on which we are able to work because they understand their books and very rightly so because npas are something that they have to suffer so banks will have to probably tweak in into more a deeper understanding of the kind of massive work that is going on and the social component behind it i think location and availability of land will be one of those challenges again because invariably we do not get it up uh, uh, that's fine uh, the capacity building mechanism webinars training programs 100% sponsored training on the internet our arc we have developed i'm sure you have seen the whiteboard yesterday we will be developing even more models you sit on the website for half an hour and you are half trained you go and visit the sites you are almost fully trained plus a bit of you know you have to be in the sector i think we have interacted with the chairpersons with these no. committees in the parliament mps so on and so forth so i think they are reasonably aware but we will keep going along the way and building in capacities there so that's my reaction thank you very much sir thank you very much sir thank you very much sir um mukta can i turn to you next yeah thank you thank you gautam um so uh, i've been privileged to be a part of the workshops uh, and the deliberations that we've been having over the last two days and uh clearly the 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 scheme is a very welcome step uh, though the deliberations also showed how incredibly complex this space is um and that the diverse demand landscape really needs to be understood at the local level where these projects are going to come up uh, for example some cities may need to focus more on students others may need to focus on industrial workers uh, and and you know there are questions about the ulb's uh, ability to to do this kind of very detailed demand assessment uh, because um, uh, the scheme has a market oriented approach and there is a sense that the people who are investing will do that initial demand assessment and bring the project to the table basis how they understand demand and there appears to be a significant role for aggregation whether by the developers of the rental housing or by other organizations that they tie up with but there is uh, therefore the possibility of exclusion which we all uh, obviously recognize but the solutions uh, to how to plug that gap for example what kind of organizations will come forward to aggregate demands of rickshaw pullers or daily wage workers who workers who stand in the labor choke domestic workers uh, these uh, these are not very clear questions to answer and and it depends on the structure and strength of civil society in specific locations and the culture of self organization and collectivization in specific locations it also depends on how the informal rental market currently functions and whether it is actually organized enough uh, to have aggregators and intermediaries already in place and and therefore there is uh, you know that 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 renters and and landlords already recognize certain patterns or of supply uh, which they can pick and and take as models into the formal market so i'll speak a little bit um, i mean clearly there's a role for the ulb which needs to be thought of uh, for the ulb district government labor department etc but i'll speak a little bit from my work um, on the informal rental sector uh, uh, just to sort of uh, talk a little bit more about demand and what really is is the need on the ground um uh, so i work in gurgaon where i look at uh, landlords who provide uh, uh, ten, uh, re- informal rentals in urban villages and these are not just 10 or 20 units but sometimes quite large in terms of 50 or 60 units being provided by the same uh, or same landlord or the same uh, family um and and these i find that these sort of rental tenements actually act as foothold for migrant tenants to come come into the city so these are places where a lot of their demands and needs are aggregated already by these informal landlords and provided to them of course there are exploitation there is rent there is a power equation uh, that is not favorable towards the tenants and and we leave that aside while recognizing it but i just wanted to point out a few things why does this supply work and 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 we i think we need to take that on board while looking at you know designing formal supply the first thing is location it is always near their place of employment and this is of prime importance and it's all really been brought up in terms of uh, what uh, ambedkar said about land availability but related to this is also the freedom and flexibility to move between locations and that has something to do with the kind of contract uh, we all know that the oral 
uh, agreement is not the most ideal form of contracting, uh, but it does allow for that flexibility for le- for renters to be able to move quickly out of locations that don't serve them into locations where they are where they feel that they are more optimally located uh, in the city. So uh, this is this is one of those uh, difficult puzzles where we 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 have a preconceived notion of what we desire in terms of formality, but we also know that the informal market provides a certain mechanism which seems to work. So how do we pick the best out of these two uh, two forms? Um, there are also a lot of unusual understandings between landlords and tenants that allow for, say, example, storage of belongings when tenants have to leave and go home for short periods of time, um, payment at irregular intervals if incomes are not steady, uh, landlords acting as money lenders for tenants to even start small businesses. Um, so, so this kind of trade-off situation that the informal market currently provides is not something that the formal market can immediately conceive of. Uh, but uh, to, to, to think of uh, rental housing as a hub that actually provides services over and beyond just that space and that roof above the head, I think is an important thing that, that has also come up from the experiences of uh, uh, rental management companies like Arusha who are already uh, you know, doing things on the ground and already have that experience. And how do we uh, build that into our imagination of the affordable rental housing complexes and, in, and, and feed that into um, the imagination of the kind of entrepreneurs who we are talking to and the kind of stakeholders that we are talking to. I think this is an important important uh, consideration. Um, the other point I'd like to bring up is that currently, and here I'm talking about uh, migrants, uh, about uh, the, the segments of the of the rental market that are not steady income formal employees. Um, they are used to compromising and making certain kinds of trade-offs uh, in terms of being able to maximize their income in the city. And, and here again, how do we... Uh, uh, but COVID has shown us that we do need to prioritize adequate quality housing. So how do we uh, think about, uh, 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 you know, the feedback loops that also educate or, or create awareness among migrant groups, among tenant groups about the kind of housing that's going to be available in certain, in certain locations. Um, I have two last points that are a little bit uh, apart from the demand side uh, as such. Um, the first thing is the current scheme invites investors who are willing to set up a minimum of uh, 40 rental units, but in the existing market, small scale landlords are really the ones who are supplying the, the lion's share into the market. So I'm wondering whether we can, as we go along, tweak the lessons that we learned to create a scheme to actually support small scale landlords uh, with the kind of capital or other kinds of support that they need, because in my view, they are the most likely to hit the jackpot in terms of being able to match the demands finally with the kind of supply that they can provide. Um, this is also already being t- tried out in, in places like South Africa and I think is better suited to the Indian environment. So can we think a little bit more along these lines, uh, especially for ULBs who are able to identify places which have relatively formal tenure where renting is already happening. This should be a lo- low hanging fruit, uh, I think. Uh, and the second thing which also came up adequately during the workshop is the 25 year period as, 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 a, as, a, as an imagination, which is quite a long place for inner city areas which transform really fast. Uh, in the, in the uh, sites that I work in, I've been working there for 10 years and some landlords have already redeveloped twice in a 10 year time frame, starting with very juggy like rentals, very, very sort of semi kacha semi pakka kind of rentals, and now moving on to multi-story rental accommodation, which is targeted as people like nurses or, or you know, or first-time job seekers. So how does the scheme actually imagine this kind of rapid turnover um, and, and the substitution point that Plastic also brought up in the market that people are actually moving so uh, choosing rental housing as and when their circumstances change, they change the kind of housing that they want to move to. So there's a very dynamic uh, sort of situation that we're looking at, and the supply is going to want to respond to this dynamism, and how does the scheme take that on board? So these these are the sort of thoughts that I had. I'll stop there, Dr. You can uh, take it forward. Thanks. Right, exactly on time. Uh, thank you so much for that, Mukta. I think it's I think it's very interesting to see already in the first two presentations, the tensions in being able to frame uh, 
policy and practice responses that are seen from the demand and the supply side, but also this question of contextualization that's constantly coming up. I think the question also of whether the economics works is also about a question of at what scale. Um, I see some questions in the chat talking about whether, for example, there is a characterization between metropolitan land markets of large cities and tier two, three, and four cities that function with very different um, incentives, both for suppliers, but also for demand, but also offer new possibilities because their land markets are not nearly as contested um, as the ones in the larger cities. Um, and this is something we'll come back to. I'm hoping I can take this question back to Amritsa at the end of our, when our speakers are done to think about the kinds of contextualization and categorization that's possible at the macro policy scale. And to think a little bit also about imagining this supplier, not just as investors with a reasonable amount of capital building larger units, but individual landlords, individual 20, 30 unit, currently informal providers, and how do we think about integrating them into the demand and supply ecosystem. Uh, Pankaj, I think it's a good moment to head to you. Uh, we've raised all your buzzwords, uh, demand, supply, market structure, market possibility, how much can we stretch, who can play the game, who's being put out. But I think that it'll be also really wonderful to hear from you about, you know, markets don't exist in a vacuum. They are structured and brought into being. So the fourth, the invisible hand also is, is structured through the kinds of possibilities of demand and supply and what is recognized as demand and supply. How would you read this um, at this moment from your position, the possibilities of what our markets, both capital M and small m, can actually absorb around rental? I just ask you to unmute. I knew I had to say it once. Here it is. Yeah. So if you see the, uh, the rental markets, like you know, uh, any city uh, or large city or urban center, if you see that around 30 to 40% of the population lives in, slum, uh, lives in uh, rental market. Okay, uh, any city which you consider. So there is always a need for rental market. In. But having said that, I don't agree to the economics of this rental market available in this uh, space of it, uh, where you have a interest regime in the 8% range and all those things. There's nowhere money, uh, cost of the capital is less than 8%. And the rental yields moving at two, two and a half percent, not more than that. It makes no economic sense for any investors to coming forward and really participating in that. In that sense, I see this is like, you know, it, it may not be viable or it may not be motivating for any investors to come forward. There has to be economic sense which should come in. Uh, there has to be interactability of lands also. If you look at the, the structure of structure of cost, like, you know, the uh, city precincts or the closer locations or the city centers, you have a land proportions very high which makes it unviable. When you go farther locations, Mukta really uh, pointed out to say that it has to be interactive. If you're asking someone to go too far away, he'll not be interested and that will not really work. In that sense, like, you know, the, the cheaper land options which are available actually make it especially unviable for such schemes to really happen. Uh, I, I, I see the viability, uh, you know, public private partnership, I see, uh, very unlikely the builders will come forward for any such thing. If the land has to be brought, land has to be brought by the state government because it doesn't really ensure any best use of, you know, any landowner will always look at a best use of his own land. Now think about it, any, any um, uh, uh, you know, uh, proposition which is not ensuring my returns more than uh, more than my cost of capital, like real estate should give 11, 12%. And I've been, uh, seen the economics also, which is presented in the uh, presentations. And I don't really agree to those economics because dormant, uh, dormitory is bad at 3000 rupees. If you consider a labor in a city who, who earns around 500 rupees per day, if you're asking him 3000 rupees per, per bed per month, Either his employer has to pay or he has to pay. That is, in, that is actually around 24% of the incremental cost. And I doubt that the, at, at this point of time, the employer will be able to take this kind of a cost. And we have done our own surveys. Like, you know, we are doing one studies for uh, in Sri Perambadur, Chennai, and we are looking at the markets. I'm seeing that nowhere the rental, even the co-living spaces for the, Migrant workers is more than 1,000 to 1,500 rupees. 
Mukta probably you also would agree. So these kind of a working will not really uh, be very sustainable. So I have a bigger issues in this, like, you know, the economic does not suggest. It has to be done as a welfare state by the government, but the government has to bring in their own land, allow someone to really come forward and build on that. And in that also, if you even consider just the construction cost and the finance cost and the approval cost, a, the, all the premium and the FSI's cost which the state government charges have to be given up and as a subsidies, uh, subsidy, uh, subsidy to someone who is doing it. Secondly, even after doing all of these things, we probably see three and a half and four percent the rental yields touching is not really. And then these are the kind of a model which requires good amount of maintenance or refurbishing. So you have to incur the various other cost factors which is available. So I don't see like, you know, India is available. It's like, you know, we take example of the developed world, but you need to see the, the places where the rental housing tape has taken a place and, and has really grown are the one where the rate and return regime is like, you know, interest rate are in the range of 2%, 2.5% or they have got negative interest. They can do this because they can invest and with, with even, and in those places, like the land cost is way too less. So you look at uh, most of the places by rent, uh, my rental yields are in the place of five, five and a half percent. So employing 2% capital and making five, five and a half percent makes sense. A country like the us, like, you know, where you have got eight and a half, 10 or 11 or 12%, nowhere the construction cost is less than 10% on an average. So if you're putting that kind of money, you won't really be able to generate more than three and a half, four percent rental yield. Uh, and uh, so there are two sides of the story which comes is like we look at the uh, appreciation. So if, if the landowner is bringing his own land, so he's seeking the appreciations. And if there is a, another party which is bringing the construction cost, that is a depreciating. And on that, he is making not much of the yield. So in that sense, I don't really agree. And I don't see, you know, uh, a scheme has economic viabilities to draw many peoples and, and, and to make it happen. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. Uh, and, 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 you know, in the paper, I've also seen that we have considered 90% occupancies. Uh, I'm saying that like, you know, too much and, and, and too optimistic uh, assumptions based on that we have tried to achieve 13% IRR. Uh, which really doesn't really ensures that many people will be coming forward. So if you look at the REITs in India has happened after so much of the struggle, but it has happened only for commercial because uh, rental yields are in the range of eight and a half uh, plus upward. So it makes sense to the institutions to come forward and lend the money for such kind of assets because they can probably see upsides because they bring foreign money, even the uh, hedging cost and all these things, there is still upside really built in. So from two and a half percent, if I were to look at 5% escalation, which is generally a rental escalation, you see that probably it will take probably 25 years for me to reach to 8%. But I feel so next eight or 10 years time, assuming my interest rates come down to in the range of three and a half, four percent or five percent, I see still we India looks to be seven to eight years behind in terms of implementations of such kind of a, uh, schemes like, you know, it. It, it looks, it, it is a need, but frankly speaking, uh, uh, it will happen only when there is a viability uh, for such kind of concept because entire thing is working on the economics. Like you are looking at public private partnerships and when, when the private person is coming, he will look at his investment and return on that particular investment, which is not getting insured with this particular thing. The landowners also, uh, 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 like, you know, if you're taking 5% escalations in his uh, 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 annual escalations, he'll not be interested. Last 10, last 10 years, the, the, the land prices appreciated 10x. Although it was highly speculated, there would be moderation. So I, my own sense is the way I see that the builders who have the lands which cannot be built, used for any residential development may be willing to come forward but those land will be not a habitable land, they'll be far away lands. And those are the kind of options which will come, come, come in for. Uh, otherwise, I am not really very optimistic, this is schemes. Uh, you know, the rate and return regime is not allowing such kind of uh, concepts to really be viable in the current regime. That's kind of submissions.
Thank you very much, Pankaj. I think it's, you know, any matter of thinking about interventions into a landscape as complex as this is definitely going to have very, very strong constraints. And I think that it is very good of us to put these constraints on the table and then look at what the policy has done to think about the gap between market rent and affordable rent, between yields and prevalent interest rates, and also thinking about how much of that economic restructuring can be done through policy mechanisms and how much of it is embedded into the land market at a certain scale and therefore cannot be restructured and requires a kind of intervention. And I think that I'd invite all of us to see not only these in opposition to each other, but I think to see the AHRC as one component of building a larger rental ecosystem. And you know, to I'd invite the panelists to look at some of the questions on chat that are talking about thinking about how, for example, state-led worker housing program. Katyayani Chamraj has two very good examples in the Q and A box about um, using the construction worker cess fund in order to build worker housing with a different logic than the dormitories of the AHRC. So I think one way to take this really interesting provocation going back and forth is to begin to say, how do we think of and conditions where a larger renter ecosystem already has the near one third rental that has existed despite any enabling regulation within this sector and look at the other end when new rental housing stock is entering, but with all the challenges that Pankaj is talking about, how do we think about them as multiple interventions in a larger housing ecosystem? And what's the bridges between them? And I think the question is to not sort of say that do we do one or the other? Actually, I think all of us are saying we can't do one or the other. And the question is how do they relate to each other? Because what unites them is they have to compete for the same land parcels in our land market. And there the question of leveraging public and private land at different locations in the urban becomes very central. And so it's an excellent time to go to Darshini, whose work really has looked at the question of the land market, both formal and informal, so closely across a range of cities and also across this, uh, you know, across comparatively internationally and across the global south. She's done a lot of comparative work with China as well. So Darshini, how do you, almost impossible task of saying, you know, here are the contradictions laid bare. Um, are there ways to think about them um, together? And I'll ask you to unmute as well. Okay, sorry. I'm um, so this takes me with the questions that Gautam has posed and what others have said to go back to my professor hat because I've been teaching this housing question for a long time and looking at it. And we know it that countries across the world have struggled with the housing question. The first book on housing question was written in mid eight it, something like 1850 or 60. And those arguments made at that time continue to remain viable even now and relevant even now on housing questions. Um, Europe is also struggling with it. It came up with a model which we adopted post Second World War. Uh, it did it completely flopped in our context uh, because I think I agree with Gautam that it's not, I mean, it's not just city specific markets that we need to look at. But also a housing market is not one market. And that's first thing that when we teach our students, we say that it's not one market. It's a sub market within housing markets. Uh, it's ownership markets versus rental market and, and rental market. And then within this markets, there are sub markets. Uh, so that is once we, if we want really a solution to housing question and in within which rental housing market is going to play a role, which we know because as the numbers now show, we are reaching almost 40% of housing housing to be in the rental market. And I'm expecting that to increase with increased mobility of labor uh, of all segments. So, so from high income labor to low income uh, construction workers and seasonal migrants and all category of migrants. So it's going to increase, but that it's also very segmented market, diversified market, and we need to think about, and so there is no, any time we think about India, there is no one size fits all answer to it. And that's the problem that governments face is that they need to, when they come up with policies, they obviously will have to have how it goes forward. And, and then uh, in spite of widespread understanding, it falls into one size fits all approach. Eventually, I think at only one point in Indian housing policy making, Rajiv Avas Yojana uh, talked about diversity and some city planning of building 
options from below rather than from top. So uh, that is the first thing that there's a very diversi diversified market. So it's, uh, and hence the markets are diversified. It's the demand and supply both are extremely diversified. And not that this, this supply and demand are stagnant or at one time we analyze it that they would remain forever, they would change. And they would change in context of macroeconomic uh, situation and I think Mr. Pankaj Kapoor talked about the viability of of rental market from the macroeconomic point of view. Uh, as we start formalizing any housing market, including rental market, the costs go up. And the court tend to live in low, uh, informal housing because it's low low cost housing in rental or ownership. And as we start going up, and so second conundrum and the problem is that the, when the government steps in, it does think about formalizing the markets. And when you start doing that, there are increased cost of it from all kinds of taxation policies, the finance policies, and so on. And in informal market, the cost of finance is even higher than uh, what's there in the formal market. And which suddenly jacks up the prices. The price of land in formal markets, though, is low. There are many other costs that the dwellers pay, but they prefer to pay that cost rather than uh, go into formal markets, which are not convenient and are far off. So that is another thing that there is need to be looking at the macroeconomic conditions that make rental housing favorable. And rather than controlling and, and, and sort of over-regulating the market, do we have a process in which we facilitate what is the current supply mechanism? How do we do that? So that's the question I think Mukta has raised that quite uh, well. The third issue is that housing, rental housing markets have to be looked in context of employment markets and employment sector. Because the experience of China tells us that it's very, very strongly linked. And so there, I think, to attract labor and then also top-down government policies directed uh, all employers to provide employee housing. And, and, and that's how, so if you look at, go, go to any construction sites in any city in China, you're massive migrant worker housing complexes. You see when you go to uh, SEZs and industrial township, you see massive housing being provided. It's a five-story, six-story buildings with uh, bunker beds, six workers sharing a room and so on. So it, it's a different model of housing supply. We had envisaged that in the early years, post in 1915s or so through industrial workers housing uh, policies and so on. And it just fizzled out, it didn't work out. Because these are all, uh, I'm not looking into details of what are the other arrangements industries have with the government when they provide housing. It could be thought of if there's massive housing provided by the industrial workers. There the problem does come and which China has faced and there's been big debate about also I, 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 in the housing question book in, written in the 1850s and when the housing is provided by the employers, workers do tend to become bonded semi bonded to the employers. And that's, it's a situation. So there are pros and cons of various mechanisms that we see uh, in, in, in provisioning of housing. We, we've had some projects we had looked at as a student projects where some of the uh, local uh, organizations came and said that please uh, uh, work out a housing solution for us because right now the workers are living in the industrial complex and they are bonded to the employer and which is which means that the wages are cut it is irrational way of paying sometimes as they bring in migrant workers and pay them advanced wages in, in when the housing is provided part of the income is cut and there is sort of a bondedness in terms of the labor relations in in labor surplus economies when employers come in with housing there needs to be a regulation and that off off of the industry and it is it's a it's a source of rent seeking, we all know. So this is a question which we have not yet been able to resolve. And the last point that I want to uh, make is that uh, this now, and there was uh, a sort of discussion of bringing in civil society organizations. If you look at in the rental market in a broader sense, you have two kinds of actors uh, who are in the supply side. Uh, one is the market, the, and, and this, if you look at it in a sub-market way. Uh, if it is going to be large supply, and it's just the government perspective, is that you bring in large suppliers 
of all kinds, dormitory housing, small housing, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then look at civil society for its management, but are we going to have civil society remaining going forward given the new laws and legislation that are in place? Uh, because you can't just say that overnight you build a civil society and then you close the civil society. It doesn't work that way. Civil society doesn't come in uh, for one single purpose. And I, I say this very strongly because in the BSUP uh, sites, and I know about Ahmedabad because I'm located there and done research there, the resident welfare associations were handed over to the, the civil society organization post-construction of the project. And there is huge trust deficit between the civil society organizations and the residents of, of, of the BSUP units. Now in Ahmedabad, the BSUP units also happen to be resettlement sites, and hence there's further more distrust about it. And civil society organization work because it, it, in context of trust, social networks, social capital, which cannot be built overnight. And so you can't just say that you have a civil society organization which will come and manage and collect rent. So people are saying in, in BSUP sites that you are bringing in civil society organization only to collect the installment. What about other tasks that civil society organizations are supposed to perform? So I think it's very instrumental view of civil society organizations in managing the projects unless they are made respectable uh, on the regulations, et cetera, are, are built in a way that there's trust on the civil society organizations, then this mechanism will work. So these are the kind of broad points I wanted to make uh, because we know that when rental housing comes in and many states have provided rental housing earlier under housing schemes, for example, HUDCO funded schemes, the rent collection has become extremely difficult given the political economy that we have in which some people pay for services and some don't, and people know that who pays for services and who don't. To collect rents uh, become difficult. And if you are asking civil society organizations to be instrumental only in getting rents, then I, I don't think that's been, we've been thinking about this civil society organizations and only service providers that's not worked for the last 20 years. Unless there's a buying from the community, it's not working out. So we need to break that uh, conundrum as well. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. <clears throat> Swastik, you said you would like to leave. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, I so I, as 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 part of the moderating team, I just wanted to uh, some very uh, uh, I mean, like Gautam said, a lot of tensions in in some of the provisions here and some of the ways we have to think about this and things like that. I I, I mean, I it's just because it is an open sort of space for us to think this through. Uh, uh, in the spirit of that, I wanted to basically, uh, and, and some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A are also very interesting. So so these are uh, propositive ideas and, and we sort of want to hear, uh, 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 perhaps Amrit sir, if, if you give it a thought or or, or just help us think through basically. Uh, from one side, we are hearing Pankaj saying fairly clearly that financial viability is a big, big concern. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, a lot of people feel that there are issues and, and, and the diversity of demand that's coming basically from various segments and things like that. And we're just taking our baby steps, like you said, so we are open to suggestion. We're trying to learn more and more. Um, various other countries have basically, I'm talk, keeping aside the interest rate question at one side, but various countries have tried very different kinds of hybrid models to actually bring uh, money into this kind of a segment. Now, whether it is, for example, direct support, such as voucher systems and things like that, which then plug into already subsidized units. Uh, uh, one example is in the US, basically, where they have something called a housing voucher, which a tenant gets basically every month. And uh, it's uh, connected to, it can be used in a, a, a building or a, a project that has been developed by uh, a, a subsidized uh, affordable rental housing developer uh, through a tax credit system. It's a very sophisticated system. It's taken decades to develop. But but as of now, so much of our thinking is that uh, if you're a beneficiary here, then you cannot be a beneficiary there. And there are these sort of segmentation that seems to be taking place in, in at least in policy thinking. So my question to you, sir, is that can we, can, what, can we sort of think about what is the future here in terms of the overall economics of this, uh, given the kind of pressure that will come and the, given the kind of demand that will come from uh, um, uh, uh, whether it's investors or whether it's uh, uh, people who require this rental housing, uh, would, would, would the government of India in the future basically be open to ideas of hybridizing certain income streams, hybridizing certain finance streams and, and, and trying to see if that kind of a mixture, uh, not mixture, well, some new kind of a structure is possible uh, uh, in the rental housing space. I mean, we are thinking of 
you know, not two years, three years, five years down the line, but we're thinking about something which will impact things even 20 or 30 years later. It will impact all housing markets uh, at some uh, at, at some level. So, so would you like to just uh, uh, share your thoughts on this? Yes. So I, I yes, sir. come yeah. again. So yes, Amrit, I hope you got uh, what I framed as a question, basically. Basically, we're looking at what is the thinking around hybridization between different models. So one example is, can we think of all the PMAY verticals and the rental as part of a ladder that a household is essentially climbing up, that you get to ownership at a point of time, but then there are various things that help you and support you in actually getting to that place. Or are there hybrid models in which vouchers play a role or other things? I mean, what, is there an imagination around what are the possibilities uh, given that the thought on rental has started now? See, we examined the possibility of uh, rental vouchers way early when we were framing this scheme. But let us just uh, calculate a rough figure that suppose the government of India decided that uh, 1,000 rupee voucher would be given per month. And we multiply it by, say, a crore people. And then we multiply it over a 12-month period. The, the stress on the, you know, the financial arrangement for the ministry and the government of India seems humongous. And therefore, this overall thinking that uh, the private sector has to come in with this as an enterprise. Even if the IRR and those things do not really match up, it was not intended to be uh, an attempt by the government to suit the business interests only. That said, the issue of ethical business, the issue of social components cannot be the sole repository and the responsibility of governments only. This is intended largely for such people who have industries, who have manufacturing units, whose units are lying vacant for want of laborers who can work productively at their own sites, largely. This arrangement of ARHC in no way tries to address the problem in its entirety. Because, as I told you earlier, the ministry is working through the housing section division on an overall umbrella approach towards the rental market and tendency laws and all that. This was an attempt to address a limited clientele who are productively employed in industries, manufacturing day-to-day -day business operations. It will not cater to anybody and everybody from the businessman who is investing it as an yet another option of making money or for every person who is seeking out rent. Yes, there is a possibility that most migrant laborers, most people in this segment in the EWS, the instance of Lajpat Nagar and you know, such places do not really uh, feature in our mind in a very big way because the Lajpat Nagar does not, got, not does not quite uh, comprise of places like Munger and Balia and Bhagalpur and Bilaspur, where a large part of the India also exists. The arrangement of 3,000 grand may have been worked out because we took Faridabad in instance. The 13% may be slightly overstated. Things may look different from here and things may appear different at the ground level and things may not play up. But this is a story which is unfolding. We've taken a lot of things in confidence. If this was just a government program, let me say, we would have made another 10 lakh houses. But does it suffice? Because if there are avenues that we create for the business and we are able to give them incentives and SOPs to be able to do some business reasonably, uh, they will see a point because it is not exactly a business proposition in the sense that somebody comes with a piece of land and is making good money and he says, go, oh, this is one good opportunity government of India has given. I think there is a, a legitimate uh, give and take. A person who has some understanding, problem of uh, the labor, whether a unit is there, may probably find it a much better thing. And 25-year period was given because of the simple fact that we wanted to make it more and more appealing, 
because earlier proposition was at 20 years after some deliberation we came to a figure of 25 uh, years and i must add that the state governments are the ones who have the housing as you know their uh, it is in their uh, schedule of uh, lists and they are fully empowered to tweak it to the extent uh, they deem it fit so uh, these are baby steps right now and let's see how it emerges because it brings about a paradigm shift it makes an arrangement let's see how it pans out thank you mukta come to you on three or four people in the chat asking a question on what you know this reality of informal providers and there's one question saying can they be taken as existing players um, can they the other question is darshini warned about and you warned about the terms of formalization um being such that they both recognize the kind of flexibility that made these informal rentals work in the first place right but also recognize that they got that exact flexibility is a limit to scaling and certain kinds of regulation and protections for renters and the others you know in with informal employment there's now a lot of work from worker organizations saying this is what we mean by formalization we mean this and not that we don't mean this and not that what are the terms of formalization how do we engage with these informal providers as we're also seeing with both amritsar and pankaj sort of saying look we recognize these are segmented markets we recognize that we're catching part of the issue we recognize that there are other categories of demand in the questions are bringing up how should we think about formalization in this in the housing in informal rental house right so um like i said even in the informal segment i mean the players are of different scales are in different kinds of locations have different uh, motivations to be for at the lowest end uh, those players are themselves needy and themselves income poor and mm -hmm. rental then becomes a very important segment of their own household income and so uh, supporting that should really be seen as a support to low income families who have happen to have property so similarly like the blc looks at you know a uh, uh, upgrade of housing uh, this could be a, a component that gets tagged on to something like a blc so at at one level formalization where tenure is secure uh, can be a very simple thing of of just allowing this kind of 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 housing uh, or additional space to be built within the parameters that uh, that, that 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 could be decided uh, but uh, for more uh, larger scale or mid to larger scale provision i think there uh, much more engagement is required with this set of stakeholders there is not that much understood about it to give an example of manisar and and the industrial areas around there uh where we know that housing was not considered in the design of the industrial township itself and the supply has come from uh, local villagers um and and it's interesting and this is um coming from work that nitin batla has presented in various places where uh, where uh, the the villagers have actually uh, drawn up a sort of plans on village land that they have their aggregated land they have gone to their panchayats and discussed these plans and then these Uh, rental uh, units have come up so i think there are certain spaces and especially because the the rental housing scheme as it's envisaged right now is definitely entering through the employment or employer route so we are it, it seems to envisage there are certain kind of spaces which are right for this form of intervention my submission is that in these spaces we need to understand what the existing supply is and first see if we can pull that existing supply already into into some form of formalization so support what is existing and what can potentially be scaled much faster because they've already cracked the formula to do this uh, and it may require you to push them in terms of uh, quality or in terms of uh, certain kinds of contractual arrangements which are currently completely unfavorable to tenants etc but those are exactly the terms that need to be negotiated what do they get right now they don't get anything right now it's in an illegal informal space but there is they do see that there is an advantage to to becoming legalized and formalized but what those are would have to be spelled out to these uh, uh, to these investors and they are investors because they are channelizing their own personal uh, uh, finances or borrowing informally to get there so there is i think a lot a lot of this that is ripe for conversion but the terms will have to be locally negotiated depending on the land tenure depending on the investment capacity depending on other kind of finance players that are willing to invest in these kind of segments in specific locations 
Because I wanted to just ask you briefly, if you were to say, you know, there are questions that are coming in saying, look, there are models for, um, you know, tax credits that underlie the US affordable housing market. There are models that are about social regulation of boosting demand and interest households. But you've talked about the, the sort of difficulty in imagining adequate returns for a private sector actor to come unaided into this arrangement. But if you could think, help us think through a couple of things that would allow and address that gap, so to say that they're not unaided, but that certain set of conditions will make a, <clears throat> a partnership viable at this point, which could include mandatory conditions like regulatory permissions, the way we design, give permission for industrial zones. So we have a history of, for example, mandatory reservations in affordable housing in townships and industrial areas, not very well enforced, but even in private projects. What do you think are the kinds of conditions that can make private partnerships at this point viable? What would need to change? As far as the interest, uh, may I also just add a corollary question to that based on the Q&A only, uh, because uh, I think it's a very interesting thing that has not come up yet, but uh, from the private side, aggregation has already started, like at the informal side, uh, informal sector that uh, Mukta has spoken about, uh, even on the formal, slightly higher income side, definitely, aggregation has already taken off and, and there's there are Nestaways and Oyos and, not Oyos, I would say Nestaways and uh, things like that, that Zolo stays and things like that, that are that are proceeding quite well. So, so there is some, obviously some market exists. So if you could just, since we may not have too much time, since you could answer both these questions one after another, I would be very grateful, Rampit. Yeah, you know, I have another point of view to really solve this problem. I'm saying that, uh, you know, we have not used our land or, or manage our lands properly. If you look at uh, lands were hold, uh, you know, uh, actually brought in in the values with the institutional framework where the administrative powerhouses came in and surrounding that the land got sold and got built up, city got developed and, and the land prices appreciated. I am seeing across all the cities and major uh, places, most of the administrative blocks are sitting into the portions of the locations. I'm saying this is a time for them to really move into a new location and upgrade the new location. And with this arbitrage, the welfare money can be taken care of or, or, or can take care of any kind of a development. So, you know, we can think about any kind of tax benefit. Uh, I can, uh, you can think about, uh, you know, subsidizing all these things is viable when the margin is quite narrow. I'm saying that the margin is way too high. It's more than double. You know, you won't be able to reach to that motivating space of it. But in this manner, like I was recently thinking about the Dharavi redevelopment plan. It has been tried so many times, but it has really failed. And I was thinking about how to make it really happen and viable. And I started thinking about, think about like, you know, we have got institutional framework sitting into our South Mumbai precincts and it has been there for over hundred years or something and which is the costliest land. Why do they have to sit on that particular locations? They can move in from there to a, a, a lesser costly uh, locations, upgrade those locations and the money which they will earn or, or the land which is getting vacated, those, those land can be sold at a higher prices. And with this money, you will be able to take care of these kind of welfare. So I, I my own sense is for rental housing, for informal se sectors, housing or any other kind of the housing, you need, you need the government to come forward and subsidize and the government needs the money. Where is the money? So they need to now use the arbitrage between the land uh, prices. So where they are, are, the lands they own, how can they move those lands uh, or, or, or trade those lands with the other lands and the, and the money can be used for development uh, of this. And in this manner, they will, they will continue be changing the structure of the cities. Today, the structure of the city has to be completely dependent upon the private sector. Like, you know, you, you, you allow SEZs in the outer areas and all those things institutional framework is not changing anywhere and they have been very very big magnets so these magnets reach so, and in this manner we can really work out bringing the equality so because of the changes in the land prices you would probably be able to solve um, uh, you know change the prices of the land and which has a very huge 
uh, uh, correlations with the people in the surrounding. So you can continue tweaking in this particular manner. I do not really see too much of merit, like, you know, adding, uh, you know, 0.5% or 0.1%, 0.2% benefits by bringing any kind of a voucher or any kind of system. Uh, it's very, very, uh, this thing. I do feel there is a, in India, uh, there uh, housing is still really adds as a social securities. I would probably see maybe not only the rental housing, but uh, but we can bring in the home equity kind of product where the people pay the rental in certain premium and they have options to own the houses if they want really continue living in this manner. Uh, informal sector certainly offers, but since it is informal, they don't have to pay the taxes. They don't have to, uh, they, they, they have lesser cost so they can manage in all these places. So, uh, whether whether the slums in Mumbai solving the problem of migrant worker housing, or whether in the uh, in the surroundings of the industrial precincts, the old villages are solving those particular problems. But the moment you're formalizing the problem is uh, you know not getting solved. I'm I'm seeing those problems. Uh, so uh, government housing is the one which can really solve this problem, and and whether the government. Uh, Accumulate this, uh, this, this is stocks by giving builders certain benefits like the EWS housing or, or, or uh, affordable housing scheme uh, in Mumbai. You have to make certain units for afford 10% or 20% for affordable housing and give it to the MADA. Those are the stocks can be used. Uh, these schemes will be there, but I don't really see uh, there is a the, the gap is quite a lot, uh, which has to be bridged. Thanks a lot, Bankaj. I, I want to pick up something in our closing question to Darshani, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Vidya for a comment and closure. We'll just take a few more minutes. Thank you all for your patience for staying with us through the through webinar. You know, one of the questions that Pankaj has raised, Darshani, is a really important question to think about the question of public investment in housing, not only in order to make the market work, but actually because of a word that Pankaj used that I was waiting to hear a little bit, which is to think about housing as part of a social protection paradigm, to think of it as part as a safety net, right? And I think that when we think about it, not just as a component of a sort of functional urban system, but to think of it as a part of a safety net, the question of the logic of public investment in it changes very deeply, right? And it also reminds us that the, the people who we are speaking about are also people that are marked by not just diverse demands in terms of their ability to pay, but very different um, uh, social, economic, and regional identities, right? These are, these, are, these are communities that belong to particular marginalized caste and religious groups, and, and they are people who belong to particular uh, regional and state migration territories. And we know that our rental market is dominantly linked, for example, to the multi-local lives of India's workers. And I think that one thing that COVID has shown us is that the one part, one of the significant reasons why many migrants started walking on the highways in COVID in all the SWAN reports, 41% of them said the reason they left was rent. Right? So there is a very critical part to think about housing and its notion of pu the public investment in it, not just as investment in land markets, in, uh, but also investments in social security. If we think of housing like this, are we able to imagine both rent and the notion of the housing market differently? So I, I think the question that you're pointing is a reimagination of the relationship of the state with the citizens. And it takes us back to a housing being constructed as a social security mechanism for Second World War in social democracies of the European context. And that is what I think all kinds of um, agitations across the world, uh, people are seeking that welfare state back in their life. And, and a new contract between the state and the citizen. And, and I think India needs to sort of rethink in this manner about what the role of state is. And uh, I think we have so far moved away from it today and reduce public investments in all things that matter for people's life. And so housing is the basic social security and you look at all countries and China's success in urbanization is based on a very strong housing policy as they envisage. They fumbled and they moved on and their changes and they 
they make changes more towards markets and they come back. And so that's where, and the state's capacity to deliver, deliver welfare. And we have now realized that electoral democracy is not the only way to increase state capacity to deliver welfare. And we need more mechanisms to do that. So I think it's, it's, it's located, it is a social security and social protection measure. It is how it was envisaged in post Second World War uh, imagination of welfare state. And that's how, and it came in handy because then it led to increase in investment and all the employment multiplier, et cetera, that was required at the time of it. And we, I don't think why we should not, we are at this moment, a large economy in a sense, and, and we should be able to do that. Uh, if you look at all our social sector expenditures, they are dismal. Uh, in health, we are at the second from bottom and so on. And I'm sure if we were to do that in housing, we would be also reaching that level in terms of percentage of GDP or percentage of budget. And we need to increase and change our priorities in terms of expenditures at the national level and the state government level. States are now burdened with huge amount of responsibility, but very little fiscal space and power. And so there needs, it's a, it's a housing is a macroeconomic and a, a issue in which prioritization for welfare mechanism and housing is the most important welfare intervention. Now, which requires changes in taxation policies and all other fiscal instruments that Mr. Kapoor was talking about, and that needs to be thought about. And then we need to sort of look at how bottom of processes are there and who are going to be beneficiaries of some of the fiscal policies that we are going to come up. So it, it, is, it is a strong reimagination of Indian society. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of uh, Swastik and I, particularly as the moderators, thank you very much for a very, very engaging, very frank, very direct, very complicated um, discussion, both on the particular program of the ARHCs, but also on the larger ecosystem of rent. Um, in the context of thinking about what it means to speak about housing. And I think that the Joint Secretary has reminded us <clears throat> that the Ministry is looking not just at the ARHC proposal, but looking at it in context with the National Rental, uh, National Draft Rental Housing Policy, with the changes in, uh, to the housing question. And I think that certainly this year has reminded us more than anything of whatever our take on the question of housing is, to both recognize the current unmet need as an unacceptable state that has huge consequences, not just on equity, but also on any imagination of sustainable or inclusive economic growth at the macroeconomic level. And I think that the questions of connecting housing markets of different kind, uh, not forgetting their rootedness in places, and then thinking of a multitude of interventions that involve everyone from the employers that some of the folks in Q&A talked about to questions of um, you know, public-private arrangements and thinking about a unaided private actor entering into the market. We have a history both of government commitment, but also government inability to build promised housing stocks. So I think it's, it's not easy to rest either on saying the state should do it or the market should do it. People are the ones who have been doing it. And I think it is going to first, I think any change is going to first beginning recognizing that all these three providers of housing stock, people, the market, and the state, will all have to be given opportunities to grow in an ecosystem and be protected. And I think that's the balance that we can begin to think about. Um, I think it's always, I would like to thank Amritsar again. It's rarely that you get to hear about the scheme as it's rolling out and get to ask many questions of it and also uh, be invited to constantly watch it as it rolls out as the ministry itself is watching it. And so we're, we're always happy um, uh, to, for an opportunity, uh, sir, for you to take questions and thank you for your time and your presence here and for the initiative that you yourself are saying is your attempt to take on something that is bigger and multi-tentacled. And if we're, I think we're all going to be very keenly following. And I think our contribution is really to also offer what other models and what other questions must come with this. And I think one of the greatest harm that happens in public policy, where in a sense, multiple outcomes rest on very singular or isolated policy mechanisms or practices instead of something that is a selected set of them. So I think, we, it is in all our interest not to let the rental ecosystem be reduced simply to the ARHC model, but also to take the most of what the ARHC model can offer at this time, while equally arguing for the other approaches and practices to not lose centrality. I'll hand over to Vidya Bhushan, um, who, uh, uh, to close on behalf of the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration. Vidya. 
Thank you, Gautam. It's been very, very interesting conversation. A lot of engagement in terms of different possibilities. I could hear the words gaps, reimagining re reimagining the roles, and also the three components that you spoke about: the people, the market, and the government. And there's roles. I must say it's a problem which requires a reimagination for sure. So there were different models being presented, being argued throughout the discussion and in preceding times also. Uh, there is one thing that I probably I would like to uh, give a provocation or a challenge or let's say a thought to mull over. See, while we do think it's a problem which is uh, in many ways insurmountable, but I also believe that uh, at the cost of being sounding slightly critical that we are being too paternalistic in our approach when we see that when we say that, yes, the market will do it or government will do it. You and us, we know that most of the housing is built by people. They are already paying some rents, which is a market rent, which is there. And it's making sense for the market, meaning by both the parties, the tenants and the people who are providing the housing stock in all parts of country. Now, our job is to just reimagine our role and see where do we come in and fit into this thing how do we scale it? How do we catalyze the whole market? There can be several examples from across the world which can fit in, but many of them will not fit also because our context is different. Our needs are very different. So um, I could give a, uh, let's say, very simple analogy, which could be completely wrong, is that uh, when we wanted to do financial inclusion, uh, the formal banking sector failed, but Grameen Bank succeeded whereby there were no collaterals, there were so, so many other problems, but it succeeded when community was involved. So probably we are looking at some kind of communitization in, the, in this 